You are about to listen to the full interview with Stephen D. Sullivan. Sections of it were originally included in our Beast of Bray Road episode. If you haven't listened to the full episode, we recommend you go listen. It'll provide context for this interview. Stephen is a prolific fantasy and horror author, publisher, and one of the hosts of Uncanny Radio podcast alongside Linda Godfrey. We spoke to him about his friendship with Linda and the legend of the Beast of Bray Road. Uh, my name is Stephen D. Sullivan, and in 1980, I came to Wisconsin from the East Coast to work on Dungeons and Dragons. And I worked on uh, D&D as an editor and then later as a graphic artist and mapper for a number of years. I mean, technically, I still work for them because they own to the, have the rights to a number of books I've written. And I moved from there into comic books and from comic books into writing novels, which is what I tend to do now. So I've, I've worked on a lot of really, really cool stuff. And one of the cool things I did was working with Linda on Uncanny Radio. Pretty much everything you work on is like within my wheelhouse of interest. I love comics. I love horror movies. <laughs> I love D&D. It's just like I was looking at your website. And I was just like, oh, my God, you <laughs> do such great work. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I, I've had a lucky career in some ways, but you, I've also worked really hard. So like most things in life, you know, you, you work really hard and then you get lucky and, and things break. It happened to break for me when I was I was literally just before my 21st birthday. I interviewed. I went to. Gen Con, I interviewed with TSR at Gen Con. By the time I'd driven back to the East Coast, they called me the next morning. And I said, oh man, I, and I hadn't gotten any sleep because it's like a 24 hour drive. <laughs> I was like, oh, I just got home. It's good to hear your voice, Lawrence. And he was like, I just got here. And he was like, well, how soon can you get back? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how soon do you want me? <laughs> and t- I think like 10 or 12 days later, I was there, so. How did you and Linda first meet and become friends? I was thinking about that when I knew I was going to do the show. And I think she and I first met at a book event at Barnes & Noble in Racine, I think. Uh, because we're, we're both local people. And uh, Barnes & Noble was having some kind, of a, some kind of a book day. I was probably there for one of my novels or something. And she was there for one of her books. And being a monster kid and... Someone who's, since I was very little, being interested in UFOs and Bigfoot and all that kind of stuff, Loch Ness Monster especially, I immediately gravitated to her. And we were there with the other people that we both knew. And so then we became friends at that event and we just kept in touch. And I think we did another library show together. And somehow over the years, she and I just, you know, we were in the same area in the same orbit and we just gravitated and, and became friends. And Looking back, I was I was thinking last night I should have listened to the first episodes of Uncanny Radio because we probably told how we met up and decided to do this. And I honestly, with someone that you're friends with for a very long time, you kind of forget. It was like, did you decide that was a good idea? Did I decide? Which one of us first said we should do a radio show? And, and then somehow we made it happen. <laughs> and it's 15 years ago now. And honestly, I don't remember whose whose idea it was, or was it hers? Was it mine? It was probably both of ours. And then I probably said, "Oh, I know the the lady that runs the radio station at the high school," and it probably went on from there. But honestly, the blur of time is is pretty heavy in between. So, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that project, Uncanny Radio. What was the gist of the episodes that you? What were the topics you focused on, and kind of what was the format, and and where did you broadcast from? We broadcasted from WBSD, which is uh, in the high school in Burlington, in the new high school, shortly after they, after they built the new high school. And as I said, my kids were, I told you in the pre-interview, my kids were going to high school at the time. And so I knew some of the teachers there, and I knew some of the teachers from the, my political work in, in Burlington. I'm, I'm left-wing, and Burlington's pretty right-wing. So I knew that there was a radio station and that they broadcast uh, 24 hours a day and that they needed content because they were looking for people for content. And somehow that came up in a conversation between Linda and me. We used to get together for lunch just every once in a while, uh, a couple of times a year at least. Uh, we lived um, 35, 45 minutes apart. So we'd often meet in the middle somewhere and, and get together and chat. And it, it came up in the conversation that there was this uh, need for this and linda had all this material and knew all these really cool and interesting people 
And at the time, there was a place in Burlington called the Sci-Fi Cafe, which was also right around that time holding little conventions where they had all sorts of guests from all fields of ufology and weird landmarks and just about everything in the paranormal thing. Somewhere in all that mix, we came up with the idea that we could do a, a radio show. We could we could do an hour long radio show once a week. And then we, at the time we had thought, well, if this goes well, maybe we can upsell it and, and start doing something like that uh, in a shorter format, possibly on oh, maybe NPR or somewhere else. Uh, Art Bell was, I think, in full swing at that point, or I think that was before he, he had died or passed the show on. But, but there was a, a craving out there for the paranormal and Linda had vast experience, and me being the skeptic, I have vast interest and a, a reasonable amount of scientific background on which to look at something and say, uh, I don't know if that's real, that's a special effect, that's people deluding themselves, that's, you know, I at one point I would say that there were, I've seen three of UFOs in my life, and the third one explained the second one to me, because I realized uh, you know, the second one I saw was a bright disc moving across the sky. And the third one, I saw a bright disc moving across the sky, and then it moved a little further, and I discovered that that bright white disc was actually the side of a plane reflecting the sun from the sun at a certain angle in the sky. And I was like, oh. The first UFO I saw when I was a little kid, and I have no explanation for it, <laughs> except it may have been uh, some kind of a waking dream. But I literally saw a... A uh, football-shaped glowing object moving across the sky that was as bright as the moon when I was a kid peering out of a upper bedroom window in New Jersey. And I knew what a blimp looked like, and it wasn't a blimp. Was that during the daytime? No, it was at night. It was at night when I was supposed to be in bed, so I didn't tell anyone about it. <laughs> I could hear my parents downstairs. They were downstairs uh, doing whatever parents do downstairs at night after the kids go to bed, and I'd crept up to this alcove that overlooked the street, and this thing just moved across the sky. It, it wasn't super fast. It wasn't super slow. It was like, wow, that is amazing, and I'm going to get in trouble if I get caught, so I'm going back to bed now. <laughs> You were um, you were known as Manwolf on Uncanny Radio. Where, what's the origin of that name, and does it have any connection to the Beast of Bray Road? That was something Linda came up with, uh, probably because of my my connection with D and D and other other things like that that had monsters in it. So, as, as you know, I'm a monster kid, so I, I uh, know a lot about monster movies. That's one of my other other areas of wide expertise, and she liked it. <laughs> and I was like. Well, I'm cool with that. <laughs> Man Wolf is cool. It fits in with the theme of the radio. I don't think anyone else outside of Linda ever called me that, and generally not not except in the in the studio. But it, it was also cool, you know. And I'm a I'm a comics guy, and Marvel Comics had a character named Man Wolf too. It was uh, uh, John Jameson, J. Jonah Jameson's son, at least in the original continuity of Spider Man. So she came up with that. She stuck it. She Stuck it on me, and I'm like, yeah, I can deal with that. That's that's kind of cool. It's always nice to have cool cool names that people don't otherwise think of. I think you're probably the most qualified person to give me kind of an overview of even just what a werewolf is. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I've I've got one book out, the Doctor Cushing's Chamber of Horrors, in which a werewolf is one of the main characters, and I'm actually working on completing a another werewolf book about a very famous movie werewolf. So. Werewolves through history have varied somewhat, but generally they are people who can turn into wolves, wolves or some kind of a cross between man and wolves. Some of the original werewolves were considered to be cursed and had come upon this unluckily, uh, which is something you see in like the Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. Others were uh, evil witches or warlocks who often wore wolf skins uh, to change into wolves and take out their hostilities upon their enemies. <laughs> so, you, you know, you'd uh, as you do, you'd put on a wolf skin, you'd go out and you'd chase down and murder a couple of children for the glory of our Lord Satan and then uh, <laughs> go back home, I guess. <laughs> so there, and there's a long tradition of werewolves. There are werewolf traditions that stretch all the way back to ancient Greece 
if I remember. And I think that guy was named Lycoon, and um, from that we get our word lycanthropy. I don't remember exactly what the myth is. I haven't looked at it lately. But it, it's a long history, and it, it tends to permeate all cultures across the globe. So it's not just not just something that came out of England and Wales or Transylvania. It came out of Greece and, and there are ones in, in China and Japan. And, and there's a, a lot of shape-shifting around the world, and often the shape-shifting is into wolves or other animals that are like the top predator in the area. So, and there was a, a big werewolf flap in the in the I think 16, 1700s in Europe, where the Beast of Javadan and other things like that were going on, and people were obsessed with werewolves almost as much as they were obsessed with witches in a similar kind of time period. Does that answer the question? Totally. Oh. Actually, yeah. The the Beast of Javadan is that how you pronounced it? That was actually another story we were looking at doing this season, but we were having a hard time. Um, tracking down people to speak to us about it but uh, it's a super yeah that, that's movie. something I, it's too bad linda's not with us anymore because yeah. uh, that was right in her her wheelhouse and i know she had a lot of a lot of research on the piece of chevron that's how i say it i had um i had some french in school and i believe that's to be correct though someone will call up tomorrow and say oh no that's totally wrong <laughs> it's really pronounced fanshaw <laughs> it's like a british name you spell it one way and you pronounce it another way so in the 90s when this the beast of bray road story really took hold people were seeing something on bray road um an animal they couldn't identify why did it get related to a werewolf what about these sightings then from your knowledge, made people say that this could be a werewolf? Well, people started seeing strange things in the Elkhorn area, and Linda happened to be the person who was in the newsroom at the time that these reports were coming in, and she was the one that was willing to go out there and take a look at it when other people were like, ah, <laughs> that's, that's funny, that's weird, uh, you know, maybe to get a column inch or something. But she actually decided to go out and investigate this thing and got the the descriptions of it from the eyewitnesses and the first eyewitness described it as kind of a man-like wolf crouching by the side of the road eating roadkill as i remember and uh linda was also an illustrator and pretty talented at that and so she she did some drawings of the witness sightings that accompanied her initial article and, and articles to come too and at some point it, start, it went from the Beast of Bray Road, nobody was sure what it was, to the fact that it looked like a werewolf. And then people just started calling it a werewolf. Even though there are no actual uh, references to any of the kind of supernatural trappings that you would have with the normal werewolves from history. You know, there's no uh, Chris Lon Cheney Jr. lurking in the background. Uh, trying to get away from his father with a silver cane. There's no witches that we know of that are wearing wolf skins and sacrificing children and that kind of stuff. The uh, satanic panic of the 1980s had thankfully passed by then, so there weren't people that were going out and uh, looking to hunt down the werewolf. Though there certainly were people that were going out and trying to see the thing, and it's it's one of those things it's like Bigfoot. It's it's going to be there when you're not looking for it and not be there when you are looking for it. Whatever people are seeing, it's not something that shows up with any regularity and can be really tracked down. Though Linda believes, and I believe, if, if it's real, you should be able to track it down and, and find out what it is and, and find out if it's in people's minds or if it's not. Uh, but that's a, that's a lot of work, and, you know, she dedicated her life to it, and still you know we don't have a body we don't have great pictures we don't have any of that probably the werewolf thing also got amplified when the local humane society decided it would be a fun fundraiser for to issue werewolf hunting licenses <laughs> uh which i bought and i i still have my werewolf hunting license and it hangs up in my studio and it's uh, in a little plastic container, and it looks like a hunting or fishing license that you might hang on a, a lanyard and, and take out to the field with you. And uh, it says very explicitly that the werewolves are not to be harmed, but you are licensed to hunt them. <laughs> so between those two things, the national news picked up the story. You know, you have a, a little little story in the local paper, but it's about a werewolf, so that's pretty sensational. And then you've got the Humane Society doing this thing. And somewhere amid all that, 
uh, the AP or somebody picked it up and it went national and then the floodgates were open and, and what was uh, an interesting story Linda decided to do one afternoon <laughs> suddenly became my, my friend's life. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, that's you kind of touched on it, but it was kind of amazing how widespread the story became and how much it took off. I mean, there's, you know, in articles around the U.S., there's there's stories, weird stories being published all the time, but they don't necessarily get the attention that this one got. What do you think it was about this story that grabbed the public's attention so much? And was there anything you think happening at the time that really facilitated this to become such a, a phenomenon? It's such a long time ago. It's hard to remember exactly what the circumstances were, but I think... We were kind of at the, we'd had uh, the, the satanic panic and the D&D craze, and there was a, an uptick in supernatural movies and stuff along along that time in the, in the 80s and, and 90s, where, you know, there were various monsters. Werewolves were kind of in that mix, but aside from the howling and the, uh, and the other one that's name is slipping, my, my American Werewolf in London, there weren't a lot of werewolf movies, and... I, it's possible that people have just gotten tired of Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster, which were, you know, yeah, we've been hearing about those for years. Where's the picture? you got to give me something better than Patty and something better than what we now know is a fake photo of the Loch Ness Monster. And I think just the idea that there was a werewolf running around in Wisconsin, there's something kind of cool about that. <laughs> a werewolf in Wisconsin. And it just... There's so much luck involved in this stuff. Even though the appetite was there, it also had to be seen by the right person at the right time who said, you know, I can fill three column inches with this or whatever was going. And a, a lot of the, as someone that looks into this stuff, a lot of cryptozoology is based on column inches that some editor was looking to fill back in, you know, 1790, 1830 or whatever. And this was one of those. And it, and because I think because Linda was taking it so seriously that it was much easier for people to buy in into it and not just write it off. It's like, oh, she's not crazy. <laughs> this woman that's looking into this is not a nut. And she's she started with these initial sightings in Elkhorn and then she's researched it. She's found ones nearby and she's collecting them and, and doing it in a really scientific and organized way. And I think. Uh, again, lacking a better word springing to mind, the seriousness with which Linda treated all of this was really attractive because if she's not the guy on the History Channel that says, I'm not saying it was aliens, but it was aliens. <laughs> right? She was never that person. She was always very meticulous about about researching and thinking about it and stuff. And she may have believed a few more strange things than I do. But uh, we got along just fine with me being me being toward the skeptical side and her being a little more toward the believer in, in uh, supernatural events side. So, and that made for a great show. And uh, we could have some really amazing guests on. You know, we had uh, uh, Nick Redfern was a, a guest we had on a number of times. And he's a, he's a terrific cryptozoologist and researcher and uh, does some great stuff. I, I'm always smiling when I see him on, on TV and... Uh, and we, we just had a, a whole bunch of interesting people, most of whom she knew because very quickly, if you're the first reporter that gets the werewolf story and you keep reporting the werewolf story, it doesn't take really long for you to be the werewolf woman. <laughs> you know, and I would always, if there was a show on TV that said werewolf, I would always tune it in and... I was always disappointed if Linda wasn't on. <laughs> We're like, why didn't you talk to Linda? She knows more than these idiots you're talking to, and she's not crazy. She, um, could you actually tell me more about her journalistic integrity and how she researched? Because that was something I think she was really excellent at, and it's represented in her books and her writing. Kind of just like your experience working with her and her process there. She never went in, into anything half-assed or quickly. She all, I think, because of her newspaper background, she always took it almost as a, a forensic investigation, whatever she was doing. She would collect the stories. And then when we would talk about them on the show, she would even say, I think that was, this is a pretty good story. I really think they, they saw something, they believed what they said. Or she would say, I think this is kind of nonsense. <laughs> you know. And she had, after a while collecting it, you, you get a feeling for who who's leading you on and who's not. So there was a, 
uh, I believe we did a segment of the show that was talking about the Michigan Dog Man, and there had been a a film that had come out at the time that I that I said uh, it it looks like a Muppet suit <laughs> to me, <laughs> and it ended up being a ghillie suit as it turned out. And mm-hmm. Linda was like, "Yeah, there's something that just doesn't seem right about this. It's like they're they're saying all the right things, but it doesn't quite mix." So she was one of the reasons you could believe her when she told you something was because she just didn't believe everything. She didn't take things at face value. She would always investigate reports she got. And, you know, if they didn't pan out initially, she would, she would tell you that, or she wouldn't include them in her books. And she wrote a lot of books about this kind of stuff. And she was really, uh, it's, it's so tragic that we've lost her because in her mind, there was so much more than it was in, all of those books combined and it was it was just a pleasure to work with her she was a a wonderful pleasant person to be with and and uh we used to i occasionally someone would drop me a note that said boy your co-host she's got the sexiest voice (laughs) and she had a great voice for radio i was listening to myself the other day and i was like oh man i wish i'd been on better allergy meds back then But Linda had a great voice, and and she had a great presentation. And uh, she used to go to libraries and stuff and do her presentations. And I, she would bring boxes and boxes of books, and she would leave with very few of them. Her presentations were fabulous. I I don't know if anyone ever recorded any of them, which is which is a real shame. If she was a, she was a master. She was really she had the personality, she had the facts, and she had the way of presenting it that. She was a great person to listen to, a great person to talk to. She was a good friend. I'm sure maybe she was nervous the first couple of times. Very quickly, if you know your subject matter, and she did, and you're at all good talking to people, and and she was an attractive woman too. So, I mean, she had like the trifecta. She knew the subject matter. She could talk about it coherently and at length. And she, she looked good on camera. So... You know, bingo! That's how you get to be in every every werewolf show about true werewolves ever, from the time of the Beast of Bray Road until the end of her life. So, and that's great. It's great that we have the the records of her that way. I wish we had recordings of her doing her presentations at libraries and stuff. But we do have uncanny radio and listening to yeah. it to just to to have some idea of what you, we you and I might talk about today. It was like. Damn, she was good. <laughs> and it's also hard to believe she's gone because, you know, we sat across the mic from each other, across the phone from each other so long that uh, it's too bad. So I'm, I'm glad you're doing this show. And people, more people need to know about her and about her work and how, how seriously she took it. Do you think that she liked the legacy of being associated with the Beast of Bray Road? Or do you think she wanted to break out from that at some point? Or do you think she was happy with that being her, the, the thing that kind of centered her in the, the paranormal community? I, th- I think she was fine with the fact that that was her, she was king of that hill, queen of that hill. That that was the thing on upon which everything else she was interested in could be based upon. And the fact that that... There was really no one that could challenge her supremacy in werewolf lore, I don't think, in the in the entire world. To be the best at one thing in the entire world, yeah, I guess you could say, oh, I wish I was best in the world at these other things too, but you're the best at something in the entire world. And then that allows you to, you know, to go and be taken seriously if you decide to, to look into Bigfoot or to look into UFOs or to look into, you know, just strange local legends. And she loved all that other stuff. She loved the ghost. She loved the Bigfoot stuff. I know she was, uh, you know, it's been a while. There was one time I was talking to her. She was doing some very serious Bigfoot research. I don't know if she ever published anything on that where she was, you know, doing one of these stomping around in the woods at night with, with, you know, local experts and local hunters and listening for, listening for sounds and hearing tracks. She took it all very seriously. And the, the Beast of Bray Road gave that to her, and she loved the she loved this genre, this uh, milieu, whatever you want to call it. The whole weird supernatural, weird Wisconsin, you know, was one of the the first books she wrote, and she loved that stuff. And in a both an academic and a scientific way, and in a in a kind of a weird, spooky, supernatural way. So. Uh, 
I, I don't think she had any trouble being the, the queen of the hill. <laughs> I think it's I think it suited her well, and it's I, I don't think there's anyone that can replace her. Did she ever share with you any theories of what she thought the Beast of Bray Road was? She seemed to be pretty convinced that this was some kind of an... She thought it was an unknown canid species of some kind, uh, in the way that Bigfoot might be some kind of an unknown ape or near human species that is very elusive and hard to find and has been around for a very long time and i she if she were here she would tell you that's that's obviously it's not just wisconsin that there's the michigan dog man is probably a very similar if not the same kind of creature when it's not a, a hoax and some guy in achilles suit well you know the the ancient reports going back into native american times and stuff that all those are not myths that they may be a real creature though whether they're a real creature that exists in our world all the time, or perhaps some supernatural uh, parallel world, or or some, you know, one step beyond Twilight Zone kind of area. I don't think, without physical proof and without good photographs, I don't think uh, that that can ever be solved. And I don't think she really thought that it could ever be solved. But she was pretty convinced that it was. It was an ongoing thing, and it had been around for a long time, and it was physical and was real and, and could interact with the real world. So it's, it's really tricky with that, those kind of things in Bigfoot. They're so hard to see and so hard to, to document that it's very tempting to say, well, they're here part-time, and they're in the spirit world part-time. There's skinwalkers, shapeshifters, that kind of stuff. Um and I, I don't think she ever settled upon what she thought it was, but she thought it was it was a real thing that was recurring. She didn't think it was a human being that turned into a werewolf. She was uh, did not believe in, in, as far as I know, she did not believe that people could transform themselves into animals or into wolfmen or that kind of stuff. She thought it was its own thing out there in the, in the world or in the multiverse. You mentioned that you have a bit of a more of a skeptical background. After hearing all the evidence and stories about the Beast of Bray Road, what is your personal feeling? Do you think there's any merit to it? Or do you think it's a misidentified animal? Um, kind of what's your take? I believe in Linda's work as, as her friend knowing her. And so I don't discount it entirely. There was a point uh, when, uh, coming back to my children again, when my children were in uh, baseball leagues and there was a guy that lived in the Bray Road area and he said he knew someone who had worn the wolf mask and had gone out as a Halloween style prank. I don't remember if it was actually in Halloween on the side of the road and had done this thing that started the whole thing. And of course, I then turned it over to Linda, who said she looked into it and she wasn't really sure that it, it had any merit to it. I think it's entirely possible it could have started as a prank. But I also think that people see people see weird stuff. I mean, I saw this UFO when I was a kid that floated across the, the New Jersey skyline. And I have no real explanation for it unless I was hallucinating. So I could have been hallucinating, even though it's if it was a dream, it was the most real dream I've ever had in my life. That it started with me getting up out of bed and ended with me returning to bed. So people see weird things. And is it in their heads? Is it partly in their heads? Is it stuff they're seeing that they're misinterpreting? You know, it's hard to say. When Linda was working on one of her books, and <laughs> coming back to my kids in sports again, my kids uh, were doing sports and it was it was a time of the year when it gets dark really soon. I don't remember exactly when. And there was a, a time my wife was bringing the kids home from, uh, from one of the sporting events at the high school driving down past a, a state park that's near us. And she saw something that was like a black coyote or some kind of an animal she didn't recognize running across the road, running away from them. And then the, just a couple of nights later, doing another sports run for the same thing, I saw a black dog-like shape that was just solid. It was like looking at a shadow edging off the road. Could those have been farm dogs or something like that? They could have been. But it's hard to say. Sometimes you see things that there just aren't really great explanations for. And sometimes if you really get caught by something like that, 
your brain will fill in information for you that maybe isn't real. So I don't know. You know, I've heard a disembodied voice too, where someone, it sounded like someone right next to me said something. And I was with a, another person at the time and I finished playing a song and the guy, and from literally next to me and my girlfriend at the time, somebody said, hey. And we were at, at the beach house before the season. There was nobody else around. There was no one else anywhere near us in the neighborhood. And we looked all around and could never find what that was. Weird things happen. So I've had weird things happen, but I can't tell you whether whether the werewolf is real, whether it's an ancient creature that, that's hiding out from us, because certainly that is not without possibility. Whether it's some kind of a supernatural being that steps from here to there and then goes to another dimension. I, you know, I'm a, I have a scientific background and we know that other dimensions are possible. Maybe. So I, I haven't settled it in my mind. But as I said, I believe in Linda and her research, and the research she did was solid. So you're never going to hear me say, oh, no, Linda kind of sloughed that off. It was like, no, if, if Linda thought it might be real, I'm willing to credence that it might be real as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. I feel like if, you know, regardless if it is a flesh and blood creature or not, people are seeing something and believing something, and regardless if it's flesh and blood animal, it does say something about the human experience and how we interpret the world. And so there's value in these stories beyond, I think, if people just blow off stories of Bigfoot or the Beast of Bray Road or Loch Ness Monster just because they say, oh, it's not possible. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, it could all be in our psychology. It's really hard to say. But Which is important so many people are so many people that are trustworthy are seeing things that are fall outside our normal scientific parameters that it's impossible to just write them off. I have, you know, not to, to make this too much about pe me and people I know, but I, I have another writer friend who, when she was a little girl playing in the woods with her friends, came upon what she believed to be now, looking back, a young Bigfoot. And at the time it was, it was at a, on, they were at the bottom of a cliff and it was like 30 feet above them. And she saw this, this, wild hairy figure that looked like an upright ape standing at the top of this cliff and it was so clear she could make out his skin and his genitals and stuff and this woman's not crazy <laughs> and she was with someone else who saw it too and it was out in the wilds between kentucky and west virginia and she saw something i don't know what it was but she wasn't lying and she wasn't, you know, it's the same as when we, Linda and I interviewed the guy who'd seen the bear wolf on Holy Hill. I believe that he believes he saw what he said he saw, what it was, whether it was half in his mind, all in his mind, whether it was totally real, I don't know. And I think we need to keep an open mind to that and keep looking and keep researching. And that's what Linda did for all, all her life. What is the bear wolf? encounter can you give us a little a little background on that uh, it's been a long time since i've heard this story but my memory is that it's um this gentleman who i think his name was steve too i can't remember his last name was driving through uh the part of wisconsin where there is a place called holy hill which is a wooded hill that has a it has a chapel on top actually it's a fairly big chapel it might be a whole church on top that overlooks the whole uh, surrounding area and he was driving through this winding road on or near Holy Hill and he had I think he had some world kill in his back of his truck maybe he'd been uh, commissioned to pick up a road kill or something or maybe he had a deer I don't remember but he'd had to stop for some reason and something came out of the woods as I recall and like tried to get this piece of fresh meat out of the back of his truck Again, this is I haven't read or listened to the story in 15 years, so that may not be entirely accurate. You can check on Canny Radio, and you can Steve Steve Homa maybe hear him talk about it. And it didn't look like Linda's standard man wolf, and it didn't, and it wasn't a bear. So it looked like kind of a a cross between the top part of a wolf, the face of a wolf, and kind of the physicality of a bear is what I remember and and we we talked to him he was uh, one of the few guests we actually had in studio with us and 
you know, if he was lying, he was lying to himself. <laughs> he saw something, something very weird happened to him. Uh, whether it was a freakish bear with mange that looked like a wolf or something. I don't know. You know, it's like you get pictures of the chupacabras and it's like, okay, those are, are those just mangy coyote or coyote wolf crosses or whatever? Are they uh, their own species? But when we were doing the show, people would send us that kind of stuff occasionally. And we're like, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So something weird happened there. Uh, but what it was, that's hard to say. Have you ever been to Bray Road personally? I have been to Bray Road many, many, many times. There was a, I used to be a, belong to a writer's group that met in Elkhorn downtown in a bar. Every month we would get together and we'd meet and we'd have, have drinks at dinner and talk about the books we were working on. And it just so happens that one of the two ways you can get from my house to this bar in Elkhorn is Bray Road. You can either go down the main highway or you can go down Bray Road, take the back, back way, see a little more scenery. And so pretty much every time the road was not, it wasn't snowy and dangerous. And sometimes even when it was, I've driven down Bay Road and I've stopped and I've looked. I've driven down Bay, Bray Road in the moonlight when the corn stalks are high, which is kind of what I remember the, uh, the original reporting being like. And it's, it's a spooky place. It's more built up now than it was then. Uh, and another friend of another friend of mine from role playing games has his family has lived there for many many years and has one of the fam, farms there. He's like, I wish people would stop coming to Bray Road. We've got all these tourists <laughs> driving down Bray Road looking for this thing. It's not here. Go away. <laughs> so I've been many times and I've never seen anything stranger than a a raccoon or a possum. Maybe. Sadly, I'd love to see something. Yeah. <laughs> Though, though, let me get a dash cam first. <laughs> we need more dash cams. How do you think the story of the Beast of Bray Roads influenced pop culture since it's since it became a phenomenon in the 90s? Or has it? I think it's one of the things that helped kind of bring about the supernatural kind of cryptid renaissance that happened around that time and, and, and uh, of which Art Bell, the late great Art Bell, was kind of the high high priest of all things weird and i i think the beast helped stoke that and it's something people were interested in you know and anytime you have something like the satanic panic which was all baloney that stokes people up about the supernatural there's an inevitable backlash that kind of goes in the other other direction where people are like well, if these guys think it's real, maybe it is real, so I should buy some crystals and I should chant and I should look into spirits and ghosts and that kind of stuff. And, you know, if you look at the cycles and you and you see spiritualism and all that kind of stuff, it kind of comes and goes. And I think the beast helped re-spike the interest in things that we don't know about and probably ended up leading to, you know, shows like Ghost Hunters and Big Hunters. Bigfoot hunters and all that kind of stuff. Those were after the beast. Linda would start doing these shows that were kind of one-offs, and then they did enough of them that I think at some point somebody said, "Hey, you know, if we hunted for Bigfoot every week, <laughs> we could probably make some money. If we hunted for ghosts every week, we could probably make some money." And those those shows are fun, and I've watched an awful lot of them. Though my patience with them has grown thin because there's you got to show me, if you're going to spend 13 weeks on this, you better have something to show me at the end and not just knocks in the other room that might be the assistant producer banging on the pipes. Have you ever incorporated the Beast of Bray Road into your own writing? I mean, you've written pretty, you have an extensive career writing, you know, fantasy and horror. Like, have you ever built the lore and mythology into your own writing? A little bit. There's a... Uh, I have two supernatural series that I, I'm doing currently. One is called Frost Harrow, and the other is the Dr. Cushing series. And every year I do a Dr. Cushing story for Christmas because Christmas ghost stories are a, a British tradition, and that's a, a series about a British family. And every Halloween I do a Frost Harrow story. And a couple of years ago, was it two or three, I did a, a story called The Beast of Bay Road which is Bay Road is a, a street that I grew up on when I was a kid. So, and it's part of this mythical city uh, of Frost Haven that is in northern Wisconsin on the shores of Lake Superior. And in that, I incorporated a lot of uh, 
kind of mythology of the the beast of Bray Road and and some of the theories of it and that kind of thing. And it's a horror horror story. And it's it's a little bit of a Rod Serling kind of Twilight Zoney stuff, which is something that I'm very influenced by Serling. Uh, and I happened to meet him when I was a kid, which was a lucky thing. Uh, so yes, <laughs> and people can go to my site, which is sdsullivan.com or stephendsullivan.com. My whole whole name spelled out, and it's up there for free. If you go to the Frost Harrow stories, you can find it. How do you think the residents of Elkhorn today? relate to the story of the Beast of Bray Road? Is this something that comes up often these days? Do you go to Elkhorn often? I, it's about 45 minutes away, uh, you know, 35 on a, on a good day uh, since they put up a bypass. And so I, I don't have a lot of direct contact with the people of Elkhorn, but there was definitely a point recently where I think the the feeling was similar to what uh, my friend whose family owned the farm thought it's like, this is all just nonsense. Please, <laughs> please leave our town. Stop tromping over our fields. Stop stopping in front of my house and taking pictures. Stop, stop the, all this tourist crap though. I, I, you mentioned to me earlier, they're talking about having a celebration. And I, I think it's probably, it's too bad. Linda's not around for that. It's probably long past it. Because people are interested in it. And yes, you don't want people trans- trespassing. And yes, you don't want them uh, tromping across people's fields or, or uh, hurting their plants or sitting in their front yards or urinating in their woods or whatever. But it's one of those things that, like the Loch Ness Monster or some of the other famous monsters, Elkhorn could do with a little bit of Beast of Bray Road at least once a year. And that's, that's really cool that they're thinking about doing that. How do you think Linda would want to be remembered as an, as a writer, a journalist, and just as a person? I think she would want to be remembered as a journalist who covered strange things in a very serious manner. And as the kind of researcher that probably everyone looking into cryptozoology and strange things should bring the kind of intensity and the kind of scrutiny and the kind of an intellect that she brought to her work on the Beast of Bray Road and all the other weird and, and interesting subjects she called. I, I think she'd want to be remembered as that. And I think she'd want to be remembered as a loving wife and mother. Uh, and she was a she was a great friend. Uh, we, you know, aside from the year that we were doing Uncanny Radio together, we didn't see each other super often. But it was always a delight to be with her. I never had a bad time with Linda. And I, I don't think I know anybody that had a bad time with Linda. She was a great person. So I think a combination of really strong journalists doing work on a subject matter that not a lot of people were willing to take seriously and a, and a good family member and a good friend. I, that's a great epitaph for anybody. Uh, I just wish she, it wasn't an epitaph. I'd love to be able to call her up and just say hi. Are you working on any projects or anything on the horizon that you would like to share? Any stories or writing or anything that, that's coming up? People that are interested in werewolves, there's a werewolf character in Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors. And within the uh, hopefully within the next year, I'll have a book coming out about the El Hombre Lobo, the uh, Paul Nashi werewolf from the film series. I'm working with uh, Nashi's family to do a... Uh, a, a novel continuing the adventures of his most famous character. So people that are into werewolves, there's that. <laughs> people into supernatural, there's a uh, frost arrow stories on my site that are free, and I hope to be putting some of those into into print books very soon. Uh, and if you're into summer thrillers, I just completed a series that's on Kindle's, Kindle's Vela format, which is a, uh, a read it electronically format called Monster Shark on a Nude Beach, which is basically for fans of Jaws and, and monster fans and people that, that uh, the title says it. If you, if you like that kind of subject matter, you'll love this book. Is there anything we haven't touched on today that you would like to share with our audience, either about the story of the Beast of Bray Road or Linda? I think the thing that I, I'd i like to say, if I haven't said it forcefully enough, is that you should take the the story seriously. We don't know what it was. I don't think Linda would ever claim to know definitively what it was or what happened there. 
But as you and I said earlier, there are strange things in this world, and sometimes there are things that happen that you really can't explain under current scientific laws or with creatures that we know. And that even claims that seem a little wacky should be looked at seriously. Maybe they are wacky, and maybe we'll find out. There are people we interviewed on uh, on Uncanny Radio who, a short time later, were proven to be frauds. You know, and there was the one time we did kind of a semi-live thing of someone dissecting a Bigfoot corpse that turned out to be a, a fraud, and that was, I thought, pretty obvious in the show that uh, there's something stinky going on here. But you have to look at this stuff to find out new things. You know, if you think you know everything that's going on in the universe and that all the stars you see are the ones that shine in the sky, you're never going to discover black holes and you're never going to discover quantum physics. And I'm not saying believing in werewolves or looking into werewolves is going to lead to a breakthrough in clean energy for everybody. But it might lead to something that you don't expect. And I think keeping our minds open and still using science and boring down and being serious is pretty much always useful in life. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on your favorite podcasting app. It helps get this content in front of more listeners, which means we can produce more episodes more often. Visit our website at www.strange-phenomenon.com for a full list of sources and more episodes. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at strange underscore phenom and on Facebook at Strange Phenomenon, all one word. Strange Phenomenon is hosted by Ray Terrara. It's written and produced by R.J. Blake and Ray Terrara. Theme music by Tara Monk. Additional music provided by Sergi Cheramizanov.